This example is from the text Conceptual Dynamics. Specifically, this is Review Problem 5-14. The problem statement reads, The 35 kilogram block shown is subjected to forces F1 equals 100 newtons and F2 equals 75 newtons. If the block is originally at rest, determine the distance it slides in 10 seconds. The coefficient of kinetic friction between the crate and the surface is 0.4 and the forces are applied at angles of theta equals 20 degrees and phi equals 35 degrees. So we attempt to read the problem, understand what's happening, and then we identify what's given and what it is we're trying to find. So we're told the mass of the block is 35 kilograms. We're told the forces, there are two, one of magnitude 100 newtons, one of magnitude 75 newtons. We're told that the block is originally at rest. And we want to determine the distance it slides in 10 seconds. So we're trying to find displacement S, whereas these forces are applied, the block slides some distance S over the course of 10 seconds. We're also told the coefficient of kinetic friction. And we're told the angles at which the forces are applied. Theta is 20 degrees and phi is 35 degrees. So I think we have a relatively good understanding of the problem. I've recopied what's been given and what's unknown over here. We were given a picture and we sort of understood that it was sliding. But now that we're dealing with kinetics problems where we're actually trying to analyze the forces that cause the motion, when we draw our picture, it's also important to draw a free body diagram. So we want to draw our object and include all of the forces that are acting on it. So in this case, two of the things are the applied forces, F1, which was at an angle of 20 degrees, and F2, which was at an angle of 35 degrees. We have the weight of the block, which will always be straight down. We have the normal force of the surface that the block is resting on, pushing back on the block and that will always be normal or perpendicular to the surface. And then in this case, we're told that there's friction, so there'll be friction opposing the motion. Since the block will be sliding to the right, the friction force will oppose that and be pushing back on the block. Once we've identified all of the forces, we also wanna make sure to identify a coordinate frame. And so in this case, since the block is traveling horizontally, I'll define my x direction to be horizontal and my y direction to be vertical, to the right being positive and, and up being positive. So once we've done that, we can go ahead and attempt a solution. In this problem, we're gonna do our solution in two steps. Specifically, we're gonna break this up into sort of a kinetics problem and a kinematics problem. So in the first step, we'll analyze the kinetics using Newton's second law, F equals MA, and from that, we'll be able to find the acceleration of the block. In the second step, we'll use that acceleration to find the ensuing displacement. So looking at this, we'll split this up into the Y direction and the X direction. We'll go ahead and do the Y direction first. And we're gonna do sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration. Since in this case, there is no motion in the Y direction, the force is summed to zero. The system is in equilibrium in the vertical direction. Looking at which forces have components in the Y direction, we have the normal force, which is up, so it's positive. We have the weight force, which is down, so it's negative. 
we then have the two applied forces, both of which are at angles, so they both have components in the, in the y direction. Looking at F1, we can see that it's y direction. If we sort of broke it up into components, an x component and a y component, we could see that its y component is up. And it's a side of a right triangle that's opposite the 20 degree angle. So since it's the opposite side, we can use sine of the 20 degree angle. So it's F1 times sine of 20 degrees, which is our theta. And then we also have F2, which we can break into its y component and its x component. In this case, the y component is down. So it's negative. And again, looking at this angle, if we made a right triangle, this side of the triangle is opposite the 35 degrees. So we will again use sine. So those are all of the forces that have components in the y direction. They sum to 0. From this, we will find uh, the normal force. And the reason that we're going to find the normal force is because we need it in order to find our friction force. Because we are modeling friction as equaling the coefficient of friction times the normal force. So that's why we need to find the normal force. That's why we need to analyze what's happening in the y direction. So we do that. We add the mg to the other side. We subtract the F1, we add the F2, we punch those values into our calculators, 35 kilograms times 9.81 meters per second squared minus 100 newtons times sine of 20 degrees plus 75 newtons times sine of 35 degrees, and we get that the normal force is approximately 352 newtons. With that, we can then go ahead and analyze the motion in the x direction, where again, we sum the forces. And in this case, there is motion in the x direction. So it's not necessarily an equilibrium. And the sum of the forces will equal the mass times the acceleration in that direction. So looking at which forces have components in the x direction, F2 has a component, where again, if we break it up into its x and y components, the x components in the positive x direction, it's the side of the triangle adjacent to the 35 degrees. So we'll use cosine. Then we have the applied force F1 which also has a component in the x direction. Again, the component is in the positive x. It's the adjacent side. So we use cosine of 20 degrees. And then we also have the friction force. And it is pushing back on the block. So it's in the negative direction. It's equal to mass times acceleration. I'll just use A because that's the direction of the entirety of the acceleration. From this, I can solve for A. So I already have these forces on the left-hand side. F2, the component of F2, the component of F1. I have the friction force, which I model as being the coefficient of kinetic friction times the normal force, which we just found. In order to isolate A, I needed to divide through by the mass. So I have 75 newtons times cosine of 35 plus 100 newtons times cosine of 20 minus 0 0.4 times the 352 we just found divided by the 35 kilograms. We punch that all into our calculator, and that works out to be approximately 0 0.4. 42 meters per second squared. And so that gives us the acceleration with which the block is sliding when these two forces are applied. That ultimately isn't what we're asked to find, though. What we're ultimately asked to find is the displacement. So we need to go ahead and do another step to our solution. So basically, we've 
done a kinetics problem so far. We've used Newton's second law, F equals MA, to determine the acceleration. Now we will go ahead and do a second part to the problem, which is to solve a kinematics problem. And so we still have the same information that was given at the beginning of the problem. We now also additionally have the acceleration. The acceleration is constant because all of the involved forces are constant. And so we can use one of our constant acceleration equations. Specifically, we can use this one. Or we can solve it from sort of integral expressions. But looking at this, we know what the initial velocity is. The system is initially at rest. We know the acceleration, which we just found. We know the time, which is given in the problem. And we're just trying to find the displacement. So the difference between where we began, s sub 0, and where we end up, s. Substituting in, we have 1 half the acceleration times 10 seconds squared. We plug that into our calculator. And that works out to be approximately 20.8 meters. Many of the problems that we do in this chapter will be done in this manner. Uh, one part of it might be a kinematics problem, and one part of it might be a kinetics problem. And so we will still be using all of the sort of kinematic relationships that we learned earlier in the semester. Later in the semester, when we get to impulse momentum, we could use something like that to solve this in one step in essence, combining the kinetics and the kinematics into one relationship. That brings us to the conclusion of this, this example. Before we finish, though, I'd like to make a little aside. So in this problem, we assumed a certain type of model for our friction. Specifically, we assumed that the friction was basically constant. There was some coefficient of kinetic friction times the normal force where the normal force wasn't changing. In reality, friction is usually more complicated than this. In fact, there's often a, a component of it that makes it proportional to the velocity of the object or the velocity of the motion of the two sides that are, that are sort of rubbing up against one another, the two surfaces that are rubbing. And so if we consider another type of friction model, let's say where there's some constant and it's proportional to the velocity, then we wouldn't have been able to, to solve the problem like we did exactly. You know, specifically, if we consider the forces in the x direction, you know, we had these constants the applied force F1, the applied force F2, the friction force opposing it. So in this case, it's something that's changing with velocity. So as you push the block and it speeds up, the friction increases. And so these are the forces, and they equal mass times acceleration, where acceleration is the first derivative of velocity. And so if we look at this, this is now a differential equation. And so we can't just solve it algebraically like we did previously. We would actually have to solve a differential equation. And so this gives us something to think about in terms of how accurate our models are. In reality, friction is even more complicated than this. Um, and so we may have a nonlinear model of the friction. You know, it may be proportional to velocity squared, or it may have a constant plus a, something that's proportional to velocity. And in those situations, uh, the differential equation would be difficult for us to solve. Something like this, this is a somewhat simple first order differential equation. You learned how to solve it in your earlier math courses. 
but if we add nonlinearities in, then it becomes quite challenging. And so in this day and age, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll rely on a simulation program or you know, software to sort of numerically approximate the solution to the differential equation. And so a lot of times as a dynamicist, as an engineer, our job is to just set up the equation of motion, which is what we call this, and then use computer software to numerically simulate the problem. Just something to think about.